So to continue also with our discussions today, we have a very interesting talk coming up. How do we attract, inspire, and retain talent? That's probably a question a lot of companies and organizations ask themselves all the time. John Peebles, will be, who has flown in actually from Edinburgh, Scotland, will be talking to us just about that. He seeks to provide an outstanding work environment for his employees. He is the CEO of Administrate, which provides training management solutions delivered from the cloud to training providers. And funnily enough, Administrate one of, has actually one of their fastest growing markets is in this region. And their very first customer was from Beirut. And who's actually with us here today, somewhere. They know who they are. Oh, right there. Awesome. So please welcome on stage John Peebles from Administrate. All right, thank you very much. It's good to be here. Can everybody hear me OK? Yes? Good. All right, so I want to talk about building the ultimate human organization, but first I want to talk about motorcycle racing. Does anybody here like motorcycle racing at all? Uh, a few? Yeah, one, there's always one in the back that's rabid about it. Um, in America, this doesn't go over so well because we don't follow motorcycle racing, but I'm big into motorcycle racing. And one of my favorite motorcycle racers of all time was a guy that's on this uh, slide here, who's Valentino Rossi. And uh, he came on board in MotoGP, which is the premier level of, of uh, motorcycle racing, when he was still pretty young. And he'd had some success in the, the, the smaller leagues. <clears throat> and when he came up to MotoGP, people were excited about what he could do. And so what happened was he got put on a very good team with a very good bike. Uh, there he is again, racing. It's really awesome when you can get that low as a motorcycle racer. I raced amateur uh, for a bit, and it's, uh, it's a great sport. But when he came into MotoGP, he had this bike, which was, the, which was a Honda machine, all right? And it was the best bike in the field. And everybody knew this, and they knew that Honda was the best, and they knew that Valentino Rossi was talented, but he started winning, and he won his first championship. And everybody said, that's great. And Honda was kind of you know, doing the rounds and the PR and so on, and they started whispering a bit, and they said, well, yeah, you know, he's great, but our bike is really great. It's the best, by far, of any bike in MotoGP. And what happened was, as these whispers started to, to go around the paddock, uh, is that his crew chief, the guy pictured on the right here, he's a British guy, Jeremy Burgess, he's, he came out with a statement to the press, and he said, motorcycle racing is 80% rider, 20% machine. And this was a pretty novel thing to say. And people were like, well, he's just biased, right? Of course he's going to say that. Valentino Rossi is his guy, OK? But he was adamant about it. Motorcycle racing is 80% rider, 20% machine. And if we have any Formula One fans in the audience today, you'll know that the common thing that's said in Formula One is that it's 90% car, 10% driver, right? So it's the opposite. And so what happened was, is actually Valentino Rossi, he had won two championships, this is very rare in the premier level. He switched bikes, and he switched bikes from a Honda machine, which was the best, to the worst machine, which was a Yamaha, and he proceeded to win two straight championships again, all right? And what happened was this became immortalized in the motorcycle racing scene. And people said, wow, you know, today if you go out and you get your race license, you're doing some amateur racing, you'll hear this over and over again. The instructor will say it's 80% rider, 20% machine. So don't really worry about what bike you have because it's all down to the rider. And what this really is, is this is an application of a common principle that maybe we all studied in business school or throughout school. And it's this guy, uh, Pareto, right, the Pareto principle. It's the 80-20 rule, or that distributions tend to follow a power law curve, OK? And it's nothing new. This guy's pretty old, although it looks like he'd be in fashion today, right, with the beard. Um, he's probably riding a penny farthing around. He'd probably be a hipster if he was alive today. Uh, but Pareto said that basically 80% of things within an organization can be driven by 20% of something else, OK? We see that in motorcycle racing. We see that in customers, and so on. And so I'm going to submit to you guys today that we've talked a lot about technology, we've talked a lot about markets, we've talked a lot about funding, we've, talked, we've pitched amazing products, we've talked a lot about a lot of things, but the 80% of the equation in order to be successful, particularly in a tech startup or in any business or in life, I would say is your team, right? That's the 80%. And so actually, if we're wanting to be successful, and think about this, right? 
um, in your life, it might be your partner, your wife, your, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, whatever it is, your team, you're striving after goals. In business, particularly a software business like ours, we don't have any physical plant at all. We don't have servers, it's all in the cloud. The only thing we have is people, right? So 80% of this equation is your team. And if that's true, then what are we doing to maximize that precious asset that makes up most of our company? So, very briefly, uh, she mentioned that I'm from Edinburgh. Here's a picture of Edinburgh. Our office is actually down on the other side of the castle. It's a really beautiful city. Um, and I'm really privileged to be the CEO of a company called Administrate, and we build training management solutions. Uh, but I'm just a guy talking, okay? You need to remember that. Like, we're not perfect, I'm not perfect. I'm up, up here on stage, but I'm just a guy talking. But I want you to evaluate what we're talking about here today and see how you can apply it into your life or your organization. And I have a dream, right? I have a dream, and I talk about this dream a lot. My dream is that we could build a company that makes its customers really, really successful and that makes our employees really, really successful. We want to become a mattress company. And what I mean by that is you spend a third of your life uh, sleeping on your mattress. So you might as well get a good one, right? You spend a third of your life working. We want that third of your life to be amazing. I'm not motivated by money, okay? I say this in front of our investors sometimes and they get a little nervous, right? My dream is to make our customers successful and to make our employees massively successful. And I believe that if we get those two things right, that 80%, then the money will follow. So, how do we build, how do we inspire, how do we retain a high-performing team, or how do we build the ultimate human organization? How do we achieve that dream of mine, right? I've got some clues, I don't have all the answers, but I've got some things I've learned. Previously, before Administrate, I built a company from just about 10 guys to about 150 employees in five years, 35 million in revenue. Uh, Administrate now is one of Scotland's fastest growing tech companies, so we went from a team of about 12 this time last year to about 45 today. Um, and it's hard, right? This is very difficult stuff. But here's some things that are practical that we can all take back and, and learn from and so on. So the first thing is you gotta build a few fundamentals, right? You really gotta focus on your brand, not as a company, right, but as an employer, okay? And this is a distinction that is sometimes lost. So build your brand, right? What are you doing to build the brand of your company as being a great place to work? Um, how do you go about that? At Administrate, we've got a bunch of different strategies that we employ. Some of them are soft, right? Like we, we celebrate team dinners and so on, and we celebrate milestones. Some of them are more concrete, like uh, company um, you know, perks and packages and so on. But you need to really focus on that brand and figure out what is, what is it that makes you different from everybody else in the workplace. There's a study that was done that said most of what the millennial generation focuses on when they're choosing an employer is the employer's brand, not really their mission, right? We build boring business software. Why would you want to come work for us? Because our brand, right? Uh, you got to build your values as a company. So this is really important, right? You got to understand what it is that drives you as a company and build that context for what, how you want to do business, how you want to engage customers, how you want to engage other employees in, in between yourself and the team. And we've got a list of values. They're public, they're on our website. And we like to say we don't actually write down our values and put them up on the wall like a lot of companies do. And the reason is, is because we want to run a little test. If you came and observed our office for a week or two, we would want it to be that you could actually start to write down what you think our company values are just by observing us, okay? And we train our team to live by those values, to use those values when they're communicating, to make sure that we're all tied into values. We always say you'll never get fired for making a mistake and administrate. And that's good, because I've made some of the biggest mistakes at the company, right? But you will get fired if you violate our values, right? And make sure you've got a story that you're telling. We have a story about our company, which is we started in the highlands of Scotland. We were built within a training company. Our first customer was here in Beirut, right? They're still a customer today, which is unbelievable sometimes when you think back over the years. And we're growing really rapidly, and this is a story that we tell over and over again, and it's, and it's nice because people like stories when they come and, and listen. That's how we learn. Um, and also focus on your HR processes. We aren't perfect at this at the start, but you gotta make sure that the interview process is clean so that even when somebody gets rejected, they know that it was a nice process, they didn't feel like they were being lied to or misled or it took forever or so on and so on. Those fundamentals really matter. I know they're boring, I know a lot of startups don't care about them, but this is the 80%. It's not what tech stack you're using, right? It's about your team. 
Once you've got your team and you've got that foundation started, you've got to really work on inspiring them, okay? You've got to articulate a clear vision for your organization. Every Wednesday, we have a meeting. We call it the Pizza Pulse because we bring in pizza. And we start every Wednesday, we put up a slide. And it says our vision, right? Our vision is twofold. We want to be the de facto standard for training providers for the software of choice, right? But we also want to be a platform that other ed tech tools plug into. And we, and we laugh about this, right? Because we put it up and I'll quiz people, what is the vision? Everybody's like, uh, we want to be, you know, and it's to the point where we, we talk about it so much that people have it ingrained. And that has to happen on a regular basis. You have to have transparency and you have to have goals as an organization. So sometimes if you don't have these things, things can get murky. You don't really know what you're supposed to do. Even really high performing people struggle if they don't know what they're shooting for, all right? And you have to have some success. A lot of times, I'll talk to people who are younger managers, it's their first role, and I'll say, you know, how's your team doing? And they'll say, oh, the team's great, we all really like each other, we go out for beer after work, everybody's really nice. And it's like, who cares about that, right? Great teams are teams because they win, right? I've never seen a team crying or fighting or you know, punching each other after they've won the national championship, okay? Great teams win. You can be nice to each other, and that's important too, but the important thing is, in order to win, you have a goal. In order to have a goal, you know how to get there, right? And that's, that's very, very important. And you gotta have a massively ambitious goal, all right? We have our vision for us as a company, as a software provider, but actually, our, our ambitious goal is to do what I said earlier, to fulfill that dream. Could we build a massive human organization that is the best, that is making and enriching lives, making lives better, enriching lives on the employee side, making our customers wildly successful. We don't know if we can achieve that, but that's, that's our vision, that's our goal. All right, talk about retention a bit. So one of the key things about retention that people often miss is they think, oh, I've got to build this great environment, right? I've got to have the best office. We've all heard that, right? Silicon Valley has ingrained that in us. We've got to have an amazing office. We've got to give away free food. We've got to have awesome perks, maybe a masseuse that comes in and massages employees all day, every day, right? Maybe a chef. We've all heard these stories. We all think about this. And we all would naturally gravitate towards that as the solution for employee retention. But you know what? That's not actually the case. Google, H, uh, Harvard Business Review, several others have done really big, long, expensive studies examining this question of what makes employees stay. And actually, the number one thing is that team members feel, they, they want to feel like they're improving, like they're learning, like they've got a development path. Okay, so quality training and upskilling, ironically it seems to most of the research out there, people are surprised by this, is the number one thing for retaining your team. All right, and I'm not just saying this because we sell software that helps you track that, right? I'm not, you can go out and do the research and so on. But it's really, really important because ironically, this is the first thing that most organizations cut in a downturn, right? What's the first thing that gets cut? Oh, the training, the staff development. You can be creative about this. It doesn't have to cost a lot. But consider this, the average organization spends $1,800 per employee per year on de employee development, and they don't know where it goes. So at Administrate, we have a few things that we do. We go to conferences. Sometimes this is an attendee. Sometimes it's to speak, right? Because you can learn when you're speaking and you're presenting. We have every employee at the company is on a learning track. They can clearly see what they need to do by job role to increase their, their skills and so on. And we're rapidly growing as an organization, right? Which means that if our employees are not rapidly growing, they're gonna be left behind. And we talk about this a lot, all right? Every employee and administrator has to read at least one book a month and turn in a book report. People think I'm insane when I say this, but it's true. All 45 are on a reading program and so on. And it's cheap and it's effective, you just gotta do it. This is the 80%, you gotta invest in it, all right? And so what really happens is then you build this environment for success, right? which is you give your employees freedom within the context of values, right? You can't achieve your goals by going off and lying and stealing or whatever, because that's not consistent with the values. You have clear objectives, you give them responsibility, and then along the way you're learning, and that's an equation for success. And we talk about learning. Learning doesn't mean just, oh, I read this book and now I've got these pages memorized in my brain, right? Learning means learning from failure sometimes. You know, if you fail, do you ascribe that to bad luck, to chance, to oh, so-and-so made me do it or whatever? If you don't actually get a valuable piece of learning out of failure, is a waste, okay? So we, this learning part, it can be hard at times, and it doesn't necessarily mean textbook. 
is the organization, are these teams learning? Why did we fail? Why did we not achieve that? Let's do it better next time. And your goal as an organization, right, is zero involuntary attrition, all right? And what we mean by that is sometimes people leave and you're kind of happy about that, right? Uh, sometimes you have to fire people. That's not you know, involuntary. What we mean is zero involuntary attrition. Nobody leaves the organization that you didn't want to leave, all right? It's like uh, Hotel California. That's your goal, all right? And this is, uh, this is hard to do but it's really, really important. Now, there's always the edge cases, right? We've had people leave because they have a medical problem or whatever they have to care for. It's not, it's not about that, that's not involuntary. What we mean is you are creating an environment that is so compelling, a culture that is so strong, and an opportunity that is so huge that people will never wanna leave. And if they have mistakes or they make mistakes, or they have problems or whatever, as an organization, we come together and we sort it out. And the second piece of this is linked, all right? you will have to fire people, unfortunately, if you want to build a high-performing organization because great people don't like working with subpar people. And subpar people often don't get the feedback that they need to understand that they're great in many things, but they're just not great in whatever role it is in whatever the, the organization. So it's not about them, it's not personal, whatever, but you have to be willing to cut the organization to the right size and get the right people on the right, on the right bus in the right seats. And if you don't have those two linked, you're gonna have problems, particularly over time. And you can get creative, right? So uh, this is the front page of TechCrunch back in December. And what was interesting is we raised $2.5 million, but actually who cared about that? We also announced that we'd been running a four day work week at our company for the last, uh, since May of last year. And what we mean by this is it's a four day, 32 hour work week. And the reasons we did this were because we believe that we have a really huge opportunity that we've got, it's a high pressure environment, there's a lot going on, but I've got this dream, right? And I wanna make our employees wildly successful. And that sometimes means giving them a break, giving back an extra day. And we kind of thought that we wouldn't lose any productivity as well. And so that's what we did. We went to a four day week, the productivity stayed the same. We rotate some teams so that we have five day coverage if that's what we need. and. Um, now we're asking the team, what are you doing with your extra day? Are you writing that book you always wanted to write? Are you learning how to play the violin, right? Uh, are you becoming a better parent? Are you a better father? What is it that you're using that extra day to do? You can't work with it because we're buying all five. We're just giving you back one, all right? And, uh, and so we did this. You can be very creative. We're a competitive job market in Edinburgh. Even though it's a small city, uh, it's not unlike Lebanon in that there's really great people. It's, Scotland's about the same size as Lebanon. There's a brain drain out of Scotland to London, very often is the case. Um, so we're, we're kind of used to that situation. Uh, and we want to attract the people that are there. And we're also competing against uh, two of the two unicorns, billion dollar valued startups that are literally right down the street from us. So we got creative. How can you get creative in your organization to inspire and retain this talent? We've got a lot of other tricks up our sleeve that we're really excited about, but you know, you got to get on a path. So. Here's some resources. What I'll do is if you follow me on Twitter or you know, check back on Twitter, you don't have to follow, I'll tweet out these resources one by one so that you can have them all in one spot. You don't need to copy down this list. But these are some books that have influenced me and my thinking. Um, it's, re it's really great stuff. You should read all of them. You would be required to read some of them if you came and worked with us. Uh, but you should check them out. And I think these principles can be applied even on a micro scale, right? It doesn't have to be you know, the whole organization doing this. You can build a high performing team within your department. Um, but just remember, motorcycle racing, 80% rider, 20% machine. Tech company or startup or human organization is 80% about the team. It's not about your offices. It's not about the fact that we're in Beirut or Edinburgh. It's not about the fact that, you know, I'm making more money or less money. People don't care about any of that. They care about that team environment. So. Um, my name is John Peebles. Thanks a lot. I don't know if we've got time for one question or not, but here's my email. If you've got questions or want to get in touch with me, let me know. Thanks a lot.